Good afternoon and welcome back for this uh, second half of the day. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce this panel um, entitled Regional Collaboration Through Technology, the Texas Language Consortium. This uh, panel will address the benefits and difficulties in coordinating resources across institutions, in particular the fit and tension between the technological modes and the pedagogical aims. Those are language instruction and education in the liberal arts. Our first uh, speaker will be um, Professor William Woods from Shriner University. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm, uh, I thank you for no applause. I, that was a, that's why thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank my I want to thank my colleagues that are presenting because uh, with every good panel you have to have a token administrator, and I'm the token administrator, so uh, my comments will be mercifully brief. That's the good news. Um, the better news is this is a partnership that we put together. Uh, we've had some success with. We've had some challenges, and we're going to hear from each of our uh, each of our teammates here to talk a little bit about what we were trying to do. The Texas Language Consortium is five colleges in Texas that were wrestling with some of the same problems that many of us wrestle with, um, lower enrolled, upper level language classes. This consortium was born, as all good initiatives, this was born in a, in a bar over some hot wings <laughs> and a pitcher of beer. It was not Twin Peaks in Waco, thankfully. That was, uh, we didn't want to be there. That's, I mean, it's still the Wild West out there. I want to tell you, sometimes, we, I liked our speaker this morning, so. Right down the road. So the five colleges in the Texas Language Consortium work in Cordia University, Austin, Lubbock Christian University, Schreiner University, uh, Texas Lutheran University, and Texas Wesleyan University. Uh, individually, we offered a, a limited number, a different mix of modern languages. Additionally, all institutions offered a varied complements of languages or courses. The teachers you're about to hear from, who are the real heroes in this consortium and the ones in the trenches doing all the work, are going to tell you um, exactly how we started to do this alignment. The the meeting that happened, it was actually an AACU meeting in Washington, D.C., not nearly as exciting as Twin Peaks and Waco. Uh, but, and I was at the table, interestingly enough, I was just a lowly dean, but I was sitting with the four or five provosts that said, we all sat around and we were commiserating about the, the state of language studies in the 21st century. And, and it, and it literally unfolded like this. Well, we keep canceling our upper level classes because of low enrollment. Well, we keep canceling our own. Everybody in, in Texas, Spanish is king pretty much, and we do a pretty good job on our lower level Spanishes. They do pretty well. Um, in fact, all our lower level classes did pretty well. It was those upper level classes that we were trying to save. And in the space of an, of an evening, two orders of hot wings, um, some forward thinking provosts, uh, and vice president said, well, what if we came up with a way to share, now that we have the technology, what if we have a way to share our content? You can see right off the map, <laughs> it's always good when an administration thinks these wonderful things up, and then we bring it back to the troops and say, so, so do that. <laughs> this seems like such a good idea. Just make this happen. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the background, and then we'll, uh, we'll move quickly into the presentation. Uh, the difficulties, the challenges that we've seen. Who gets to do that slide? Who's the, oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'll wait. She can do a better job of it than me. I'm just going to read to you quickly from our, uh, from our shared statement of purpose and why we are, why we are doing what we're doing. Um, the restriction was not a disinterest on the part of students. Students want to study a rich curriculum or resistance on the part of instructors or, uh, instructors or institutions in providing a array of foreign language courses. We were all on board. We all know how important it is and we all, we all, we bought in, we've bought into it. It was just trying to make it work. Rather, the restriction has been the result of the economics of sustaining resources necessary for such a curriculum. As Provost Schreiner University Provost Dr. Charlie McCormick noted in our shared statement of purpose, uh, our existing approach was this. We all offered Sp Spanish at the introductory and interme intermediate level. And perhaps we offered an introductory level of a second language, or perhaps a third language. None of us believed that we were providing students the robust experience of a second language that we wanted to provide. A significant part of the problem was that we could not afford to offer the breadth or depth of our languages that students wanted and needed to take, and students therefore considered their world language courses a requirement to complete rather than an essential skill for the 21st century. 
As a result, courses were under-enrolled and therefore frequently canceled. Faculty were unhappy with their load, teaching primarily introductory courses that were full of unmotivated students, and students were not developing the language or intercultural skills they wanted or needed. That sounds fairly bleak, doesn't it? Well, this is what we were trying to do to solve some of that problem. Beginning in 2010 with the availability of affordable virtual technologies, again in 2013 with the emergence of best practices for blended learning, it became reasonable to begin to develop mechanisms to provide access to a broader curriculum. By leveraging this technology, students at our institutions are able to have, a more, have more world language opportunities than they were ever able to have before the consortium was in place. The benefits of such a program's TLC go beyond merely providing access to additional language offerings. The TLC also opens up opportunities to new curricular approaches to our existing languages. Uh, we've had nursing majors at one institution express interest in medical Spanish courses. We've had other student business majors at other schools get interested in uh, business Spanish. These are the intersections of academic interest between institutions such as ours that such collaboration can identify and leverage to the benefit of the students. Such collaboration reveals previously undiscovered and rich connections between curricula. Building a collaborative curriculum helps all of our institutions meet the challenge of giving our students access to the academic career appropriate to the network world. So that's the background to it. That's how it came into an existence, and that's what we were trying to do. And um, some of us have, have um, some of us a little bit removed from it, think it's a rousing success, and it has been in many regards. And now you get to hear the rest of the story. I think my colleague, Anne Marie, is next for you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Ana Maria Gonzalez and I represent Texas Lutheran University. Uh, my job today is to give you an overview of the consortium. Uh, we already heard um, some idea, you know, from Will, but let's see if this gives you a better idea of what we're trying to do. And we don't have a clicker, so I don't know if this mouse is going to work. Okay, so what are the uh, TLC? TLC stands for uh, Texas Language Consortium, but I think that on the way, somehow it's going to become at one point Texas Learning Consortium, we so we don't know exactly how it's going to go. So um, if you are familiar with the state of Texas, this is where we are. Uh, mm -hmm. In the first place, we have Concordia University, Texas, which is really located in, the, in Austin, in the Austin area. Uh, we also have um, Loma Prisa University. We have Sharnia University, and Will is representing that university. We have uh, Texas Lutheran University, and that's my institution. We also have Texas Western University. So as you can see, the main thing is for us to consider uh, regional, small, liberal arts uh, colleges. And uh, these different distribution that we see in, on the map really help us to have a better idea of the different needs that we have in different areas of the state. So it's not just one section of the state, but as you can see, we try to cover as much as possible. And certainly, there is still the conversation on opening the, com uh, the consortium to other institutions. So I'm just listing some of the similarities, and he already mentioned the mission of Australian University. I think that the main thing that we have in common, as you can see, is that we are talking about leadership, we're talking about global mission, and we're talking certainly about you know representing the society for, for the better of others. So in this case, languages are essential. And we, we have a very strong, uh, at least at here, you will have a very strong program you know, for servant uh, leadership, which means you know students really need to engage in civic engagement, but really need to do something for others. They really need to provide you know, with the knowledge that they have to benefit other people. So uh, other similarities that we find, you know, we're certainly private, uh, very small. Uh, all of us from the 2,000 students, uh, of course, on top of it, we are arts, all, we all have degree granting, and I think in some institutions we also have master's degree. Uh, privately baccalaureate, uh, the title for recipients, you know, and that has been certainly a big struggle for us and for the students. Uh, the residential days, we all have dorms, and certainly we have tuition dependence. So we really depend on how many students we have at the institution for us <coughs> to be able to drastically survive and continue. We also have, um, we're all affiliated with our religious institution, as you can see, uh, different institutions represent, you know, uh, the, the faith of these um, institutions. And then we have other characteristics. I wanted to highlight and keep, you know, the number of students that we have. Uh, interesting, you know, we have about the same Concordia and Lobo Christian, a little less in Shriner, and 
University of Finland numbers for Texas Lutheran and the North of Texas, for example. Okay? And the faculty ratio. So we all have these small classes, and that is also very important, which is certainly a uh, great value when we try to advertise our institutions, you know, small classes, but small classes also represent, you know, the problems with low enrollments and then cancellations. So what are the language requirements for each institution? Okay, so in general we have, um, again, I'm just gonna list several of the requirements. At Concordia we have two semesters for most degree programs, which means not every single student has to take a foreign language class, okay? The same thing here. At Lula Christian University, we don't require all students to take a world language, but certainly most of the programs do. Um, the same case for uh, Trinity University. Uh, but certainly we also have the option for global perspect perspectives, and that's something that we used to have at Texas Lutheran University, that instead of taking a foreign language, the students can also take a global perspectives class or uh, you know do something like study abroad instead of taking the foreign language. So but we still have some of the programs that require specifically the languages. Uh, the same thing at TOU, uh, now we have at least one course that students have to take. Okay, and that is certainly very beneficial for us because we didn't have that in the past. And I think that we are really the exception for all these institutions. And now every single student that graduates from TOU needs at least one course. The second one is optional. And it's optional because instead of taking another foreign language, you know, another course, uh, they can take uh, theology or they can take something else related, you know, to um, the cultural exchange. And some of the programs they still have, you know, three, six, or nine credits. Okay, um, and the same thing as you can see with OSM University, no, not all the students have to take a language class, but a lot of the programs require it. Okay, so this is, um, I would say, the feature that we have before we came out with the Texas Language Consortium. Okay, so uh, the previous language offerings, as you can see, you know, we still have some uh, holes there that we need to fill. And what are the difficulties that we face? Again, small schools, but also small classes. And small classes, sometimes if we don't have the minimum requirement, you know, five students per course, then at least that is there is a cancellation. And we face that continuously, specifically for a TOU with French. Um, Spanish in all our institutions is, I would say, very stable. But in other languages, pretty much, you know, they're disappear or simply, you know, even if we have the, the minor in French, for example, we don't have the students, and therefore it's this um, catch-22 situation because we don't have the program, therefore we don't have the students, and we don't have the students, therefore we don't have the program. So at one point, we really need to say where do we start and how we can continue together. Um, again, the small language programs, they limit the number of languages, okay? And most of these institutions, with the exception of uh, Concordia, you know, they only offer one or two different languages. Uh, again, as I said before, the low language uh, course enrollments, one or two students in the class was canceled. Uh, unfortunately, the lack of resources because we cannot afford to pay, you know, someone to teach only one or two students. And that's the result, you know, the cancellation. So from that conversation, uh, we, um, I don't know exactly how, if it was nine of that approach, so we approached nine, but I know that it's a very, very interesting correlation that we have with nine. Are you familiar with that? And I know that provides you know the support uh, for this. This is really the foundation for blended learning. Okay, so that's uh, the key organization for the liberal arts colleges and universities. And this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to engage students in the unique learning experience uh, with technolo technology. Okay, so what is that we have to do? And we have to be members of NIO for us to receive the benefits, of course. Uh, we continue with the initiative, you know, then uh, we really try to do something else uh, to save these classes and still to provide the kind of education that we want to provide. And that's why the cooperation has been very possible, you know, considering these different institutions that we have, because we all have the same problem. And the collaboration with NIDO really breaks the ground, you know, for us to, to make this possible. Uh, unfortunately, and we're going to be talking about that later, we don't have the technology that we really need, and, and we're still in conversations how to improve. 
So the main goals that we have is to offer courses that cannot be offered otherwise. That's very important. That is relevant for us. You know, that's the whole purpose of the consortium. And to increase enrollment in some of the language courses by expanding the potential of student base to the other four universities. And um, in a little bit, we're going to be talking about how exactly that works. Okay, so we started ready in 2002, 2012-2013. We only are finishing our third year right now, and uh, we continue really looking for better options to to increase, you know, the uh, the flexibility of the program, but also the effectiveness of the program. It was uh, formally established in fall 2013, and. Uh, this program certainly involves, you know, the idea of lecturing, you know, common course assignments, uh, cross-campus collaborative, uh, collaborative uh, projects. And when people ask about, you know, how does it work, a lot of people immediately think that we're talking about online courses, and that is a, a big difference that we really need to establish, okay? When we're talking about blended is the students that still have an instructor at the same time, I just is such a different location, okay? So it's really, happening at the same time. The different students would be at the same time receiving the same information from the same instructor, okay? So the students participate in a video conference in which they compare cultural approaches to similar issues, okay? They learn other perspectives, and certainly uh, the instructors are from different institutions. And at this point, we have four different instructors from the four different institutions. They can also work together in a small cross-campus groups to produce and present a project. And uh, we try to have regular faculty meetings. As you can imagine, we also have these meetings um, through video, and sometimes work, and sometimes, you know, they don't work, okay? <laughs> and faculty members attend workshops in the summer, and we have one for June 14, 15, uh, just coming right now. So at least once a year, we try to be together face-to-face -face and try to work. So this is actually the first time we have this group here. So we didn't we didn't even meet before at least with one or two. So this is what has changed. So I showed you before, you know, the, the previous offerings and the TLC is there. Okay. So now we're gonna be talking about how many students can really take advantage of that. At least we have the potential, we still need to continue working to make it a reality. So at least, you know. The TLC is present, and uh, this represents certainly something very beneficial for, for all of us, okay? Uh, at least in this year, 2013-2014, four students received the benefit of those courses, okay, that we didn't have before. So you can see, you can have a, an idea of, you know, how those courses have been being uh, offered. So what are the challenges, of course? We have probably more challenges than benefits, okay? <laughs> at least at this point, okay? Many parents involved in coordination uh, becomes difficult, and from my own experience, you know, as chair of the Department of the Foreign Languages uh, at TOU, I need to make sure that the secretary knew about the, you know, the location, the time, the name of the instructor, the cell phone, because the, you know, at one point we have a problem, and <laughs> Rodrigo is here also, Everybody need to run because we didn't know where the students were, or you know how is that they were going to have an exam, or who was going to be proffering the exam, who was going to be making copies, who was going to be collecting them. So there is a lot of people, you know, that really need to get involved from the IT, the secretary, the professors, etc. So mm -hmm. collaboration is essential. And registrars. Oh yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So that is sometimes not very easy for us to handle. Okay. Uh, certainly, this is first represents a, a new way to teach, and we all know that. Okay, so students sometimes don't really know exactly what is going to happen, and unfortunately, very often the students drop the class because they feel completely isolated, being by themselves. You know, I would say one student in the classroom just, you know, trying to follow the the professor on the video, and they say, you know, this is not for me. I really need a little more personal interaction, and we completely understand that. Okay. So that's why we have the tendency to drop the course, and it has been the case, so unfortunately. The institutions also involve a different technology resources. Okay, we are not at the same level. For good or for bad, but unfortunately, we are not at the same level. And the limited classroom, uh, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of classrooms with that technology. That implies, you know, to have the camera, to have a good microphone for 
professors to move around, and the same thing for all of the institutions. And sometimes what we have seen is that uh, sometimes that works if there is only two institutions connected, but once we have a third or a fourth one or maybe the fifth one, then there is a lot of interruption and certainly that's something that we need to find a solution for. Or just the class schedule last semester, that's exactly what, what we have, you know. When we don't have enough classrooms, we cannot have a consortium course over at the same time because then it's either one, you know, it's either Chinese or German, but we cannot offer both. Again, we're talking about opportunities and certainly we want to be optimistic. We want to think, you know, that things are working, you know, maybe not the way that we wanted, but they can be better. And we got a grant uh, uh, last year, and I believe it was for 25,000, mm -hmm. you know, just to help us to continue with this um, collaboration. Uh, we are considering, we don't really know, you know, what possibilities we're gonna have for adding other languages like Arabic. Arabic is probably next in line, you know, to, for us to consider, but certainly Italian, Japanese, Russian, and we have a survey that we pass to students for them to tell us, you know, what kind of languages would you like to have at your institution. And although the number is still small, you know, we know that uh, for the students in one given year, I think it's a good number, you know, that otherwise it would be uh, practically impossible for them to receive that language. The study abroad, you know, at the beginning, the German professor actually, you know, uh, Silke, was really very positive about taking the students to Germany, and that also implies a lot of coordination and certainly work, uh, you know, from everyone. Uh, and possible inclusion of other areas, and that's what I said at the beginning, we call it the TLC, because people want to have open mind and thinking, okay, is it in Texas Language Consortium or Texas Learning Consortium? So that is, you know, still a possibility that we can consider. Okay. Thank you, Anna Maria. Uh, my name is Ray. Uh, I work in, uh, in uh, Concordia, uh, Concordia, Texas, Concordia. Concordia University of Texas uh, in Austin, and I'll be talking about the reality of our TLC classrooms, what's really happening in our daily teaching. Um, I, I still remember the first day I started teaching uh, this course uh, through uh, consortium about two years ago. It was like a hundred degree Texas hot day. And then I, I arrived at a classroom like 20 minutes before the, um, the, the starting time and a bunch of technicians to trying to help me help me to uh, start to um, to dial, dial to different universities to try to get connected but then we still have lots of problems that day we tested before it worked fine but that day it still didn't work so we ended up um, starting the class actually a uh, half hour later you know and then I was like, so frustrated and all sweaty <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'll give you a, a picture of you know our classroom so, so first of all, uh, so each each of the universities here they have quite different um, models of their equipment, um, and that's probably one of the reasons that uh, we have quite varied sound quality and, and video quality depends on where you're from. Um, uh, so here is a picture of my classroom. So I teach Chinese in this classroom. Uh, this is a student view. So we stand at the back of this classroom and look uh, uh, to the front. So you see two big screens you know, on both sides of the classroom. And the student here, the local student from Concordia, can see both of <coughs> the screens. And one of the screen can display whatever I want to show them from the computer desktop. And the other screen shows the distance student, which means students um, from one or more of the other in universities, and they can see me uh, or the desktop as well. But sometimes it's hard for the recent student to see the local Concordia student on the screen. Can you take a picture of that? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah of course. I think it's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, and also you can see, oh, I forgot to mention, you can see the uh, camera. There's two cameras in this room. One is for uh, the students. And the other one is on the back of the room is for an instructor. So, oh. Ray, could you make your um, PowerPoint slide collection here because she'll show quite a few available to people? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. I can do that. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and this is the teacher's view. So I'll send it, send, uh, in front of the classroom, I can see the student, and then I have a computer right in front of me, um, and actually I have a small monitor. I'll show you in the next slide. Okay, so you see this little control monitor. Yeah, I see something, something very similar here, a, a small control <laughs> monitor. Actually, it's from the same brand. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so I need to get, before the class started, I need to get familiar with how to use this little, little box because that allows me to switch cameras, either show the students the instructor or the students in the classroom. And then I can also switch um, uh, the, the screen to show either the desktop, you know, the computer desktop, or the, the other students from other ca uh, campuses. And then you see there's a sound camera here, so you want to show a document or blog that cannot be projected from a computer, you can do that too. And then uh, I wear this um, microphone every day, uh, so the, the, the sound will be a little better to pick up. Of course, in our classroom, there's the ceiling, um, what do you call the ceiling microphone, that pick up the sound from the students as well, but that's less, uh, less uh, good quality than you know, wearing a microphone, a personal microphone. Okay. Um, and here's a you know bigger picture of the con little control monitor. So as you can see, I can um, switch either like video call to monitor or the podium PC to monitor. Which means if I click this video call to monitor, I can see the distant students from this my desktop. I'll get a much better view. This the video quality is much better. I can see, you know, everything they're doing from this uh, from here. Uh, much better than if I look at them from the big screen. Yeah. So here, for example, like this. Yeah. So I have um, one student from um, Lubbock University and the other one from uh, Texas Lutheran University. And here's a small screen of what they also, what uh, their view is. So that's their the instructor view from their point of view. They're taking tests right now. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, um, and then oh, before each class, we can uh, dial to each university from the keyboard added here. So each of these universities will have a, have their own um, IP numbers. So we'll just dial the numbers and then um, you know try to connect. Sometimes, yes. Somebody had a question. Oh, sorry. Oh, gosh, right. Do you record the sessions so that if someone might need to review and then miss a session, they catch up? No, we that's don't. actually because it's kind of already. Yeah, we do that in our online course. Okay, yeah, I mean, like using Moodle, you know, with the big okay. green button. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So, a student can view that later, but but not for this course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's more like a real time. Yeah, it has to be real time. Real time, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so usually the host university dial to the, the other participating universities. And if, they, if there's a problem and they're trying to dial back, it's not going to work. So there's lots of times when this happens, we have to call the technicians from all the universities, you know, then. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and then also from one, one tap under video call, you can um, uh, change the input, uh, the source. I mean, uh, you can you can control the camera up here. So, for instance, you can control the instru instructor cam uh, to be zoom in, zoom out, move mm -hmm. left, move right. You know, and then you can you know switch to student camera so that the distant student from other campuses can see your students. Otherwise, they cannot see. Mm -hmm. Not sure. Data at the same time. Um, and. Oh, here's a short video of oh, the help here um, to show um, how the classroom goes. This is a short video of uh, one of my students giving final presentation. Uh, he's from another university. Uh, and here's the PowerPoint of his presentation. I can pull up this PowerPoint from my desktop and show it to all the students. Um, But we can, oh, I think this one, uh, can you swap the, this one? Okay. Oh, 
Although the camera, the, the teacher's camera is facing me, I'm supposed to look at the camera, right? So the distant student will see me facing them. Mm -hmm. But then it's as a human um, intuit intuition, I, I want to look at their face when I talk. So, <laughs> so I still can't avoid, you know, looking back. Yes. We have, we're working on a project like this in Pennsylvania, and what we did is we put one of the things in the, the back screen, room, yeah. the screen in the back room, so that that, you can have that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good idea. Um, but this, I don't know how difficult it's for me to change this setting. <laughs> I would borrow the space from actually the nursing program oh, yeah, that helps people with the money. Um, and so we're stuck with the configuration of technology that yeah. we inherit. Yeah, we'll talk about that possibility. Oh, sorry, it's hard to change the setting for mm -hmm. from now. <laughs> but thank you. Um, and oh, yes. I was wondering mm -hmm. how students at remote sites participate, uh -huh. or can only one student participate at a time? Can you have multiple locations participate at the same time? Yes, they can talk at the same time. Yeah, I can hear them uh, talking, no matter how many students uh, there are. Uh, but if they talk at the same time, it can get very loud. Because like in that room, I guess. Yeah. yeah. No, it's worse than a regular. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. their their sound all come from the speaker, you know, and so it, it can be there. Sometimes there are a lot of echoes, lots of you know the, the noise. So, so I'm gonna be talking about that when, especially when we do group works. This you know presents a big challenge. Yeah. Um, so okay, a couple more uh, slides showing you the the classrooms from other universities. So this is from uh, Lava Christian University, uh, one of the rooms they are using. I think they are using the um, ITV system. And yeah, so this is this is student earlier giving the presentation. Uh, this is from his view. So he looked at this little uh, this screen there. He can see me, the instructor. He can also see one of the other distant um, students from the text and from the. Uh, uh, Screen, but he cannot see the student from Concordia, you know, from my, my school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless I switch the, the view. Um, and he, he, he has a um, camera there too. Yeah. Um, actually, there is another screen, see on the back of the classroom, mm -hmm. but it's not, um, it, they don't use it. <laughs> yeah. That would make too much sense. <laughs> <laughs> what would that be used for? Uh, the, well, it's not. It's just not connected to to our system. I asked them before. Yeah, just only one of them can be used for now. And this is a more close up for you know what he can see from the screen. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Texas Lutheran University. They have a big screen and a small screen mm -hmm. here. Where you can see the other students. Yeah, yeah so you, you can see the other students and mm -hmm. a small, small uh, screen of the instructor. Um, but sometimes the video quality, the video image uh, is uh, sometimes it's blurry you know, from from that uh, institution. And uh, here's a close up. Oh, it's just that. <laughs> Our uh, German, I mean, um, German, no, German, German instructor. German. Yeah. And then here's a view uh, from the the front of the classroom. Um, and also you notice they have a whiteboard here. Um, actually they have a whiteboard on this wall as well. And sometimes if I ask the students to uh, do some writing on the whiteboard, uh, they can actually change the camera view to show the whiteboard so mm -hmm. I can see what they're writing. Um, 
on the whiteboard. But still, sometimes it's hard because of the uh, the video quality. Uh, because I'm teaching Chinese, um, they, they have to write the characters really big in order for me to, to see. Yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about some uh, tech support uh, in, in these universities. So, as I said, um, usually at the beginning of the class, there is a technician or a student assistant who will help the instructor to set up, you know, help dialing up or, you know, any technical issues. Uh, but when it's set up, when it's connected, uh, usually just the instructor controls the monitor or the camera. At least that's the case in my school. And then, um, in Shriner, actually, one of the good things is their camera actually follows the instructor. That's pretty cool. So it's, it's way cool. So, yeah. so the instructor can walk around the classroom, you know. And for me, I can only just sit here, you know, and move my head like. This. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, yes. To, just to respond to motion, I, I, the instructor brings some kind of a control to have the camera follow. It does respond to motion. It's, okay. it's the mic. It's actually the microphone itself. Oh, right. It's so not only do we have. Uh, I'm thinking of Silica Phelps, who was uh -huh. so animated. She would. She yes. gave that machine okay. a workout. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, of course, there are a lot of advantages of using this this technology, right? Um, so it gives us this excellent opportunity to offer and learn. Um, those critical languages defined by the government, or those less taught languages like uh, Mandarin Chinese or Portuguese and Hebrew and all these languages. Um, and it makes the language teaching resources accessible for a much larger student, uh, student population. So, so uh, students from one uh, institution can actually choose multiple languages to study if they wish, right? They can they can choose maybe Chinese and German, Spanish and French, you know, as many as they want. They can handle. <laughs> yeah. And also, um, since this is a like a hybrid uh, classroom environment, it's not entirely online. It's very different from entirely online courses. It's more real time. So this offers better quality of uh, language instruction uh, than online only classes. Although not perfect. <laughs> and. Um, for some of the textbooks we use in the foreign language classroom, sometimes they have the companion website where you can submit uh, homework assignments uh, entirely online and, and automatic, automatically graded. Um, it, it gives us a, you know, an easier time for the student and the teacher for the homework submission. However, this may not be the case for all courses because uh, some instructors may not like that that approach, or for some languages like Chinese, uh, the handwriting is very essential. So I don't do all the homework uh, submission uh, online, but that's an option. And also, it offers instructor and students more flexibility with office hours and making employment. So with a distance student, it's 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 very it's impossible to hold a regular office hour for them. So I always ask them to, you know, make a Skype appointment with me or, or talk on the phone, you know, anytime, just make an appointment with me. Um, and since we are collaborating with all other universities, so it's a, it's a great vehicle to foster this inter-institutional research among language professors. If we, we can collaborate on different, you know, language projects. Yeah. Um, challenges. There'll be more slides in the challenges. <laughs> <laughs> so unexpected technology issues often occur and take up uh, class time. So always, always have a backup plan. That's what I learned. You know, hard lesson. <laughs> I always bring my laptop. You know, like today. <laughs> if I didn't bring. It. So um, always have a backup plan. And also, due to the different uh, equipment from each school, the the video and sound quality vary to a degree. Sometimes you get really good sound quality and video quality. Sometimes it's less than ideal. A lot of times you have to say, "Huh?" They said again, because you're not really talking to that part. You you have to, you're not well, talking to uh, air, you know, <laughs> and, and kind of feel. <laughs> um, and also, when showing computer the desktop to the, to students, um, in some schools, the instructors cannot be showing the same screen. So you have to choose what to show the student. Um, and the students don't see the classmate at the host university or in very small screens. Um, of course, these equipment can be very expensive to install in each classroom. 
for example, the ITV system, I think each room requires like $6,000 or something. So, and, and sometimes they're vulnerable to hacks too. Um, yeah, I heard from Ibrahim that in, in his uh, Portuguese class, sometimes they get these calls from India. <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> the ITV system. <laughs> Yeah, it's very. And I say, are you happy with your current provider? <laughs> <laughs> so they have to deal with all kinds of issues like that. Um, <laughs> and of course, the, the less than ideal sound of video quality can affect foreign language teaching learning. We know how important the, the sound, the uh, accuracy of the sound is, how important that is to uh, learning a foreign language, right? So uh, if we have students with disabilities, may find it even more challenging to, to follow the class. For instance, you know, if we have students with attention to the, the, the disorders, it may be very hard for them to follow all the different screens, all the sounds coming everywhere. And if they have visual or uh, hearing impairments, it's also very difficult for them to follow. Um, of course, these distant, well, partially distant courses can be an environment with limited limited human interaction, for example, when you do small group works, it can be very difficult, especially when you have very few students in the classroom. So in one of my classes, I only had like three students, like the pictures you just saw, and three of them are from three different universities. So it's, it's very hard. Um, and when I had more students, if, uh, one semester I had like 11 students or nine, yeah, about 10 students. So it, it, so I got a couple from one university, a couple from the other university. So in doing uh, group work, I'll just let the students from the same university work together because I know it's not, I don't, usually I don't want the students to work with the same people every time, but I have to do that because I try to let them group inter, uh, different, you know, from different institutions. And then the sound is just very, um, it's just not clear. It's, if, you, if you put everybody's sound out and you hear, you can't hear anything. So I have to mute the distant students in order to hear what's going on in the classroom. Yeah. And uh, because of this limitation, certain hands-on activities uh, may be very uh, impractical too. Um, because in a foreign language teaching, foreign language classroom, Usually there are a lot of you know um, hands-on practical activities in a traditional classroom, but with this kind of settings, it's just very difficult to implement. Yeah, for instance, if I, I if I want to do like a um, activity that students needs to walk around the classroom and talk to everybody, you know, then it's impossible to do it here or you know in a different way. And also, some some distant learners may feel com uncomfortable facing a camera that record their movement. It's not like really record them, but some people are very conscious if there's a camera just facing them. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then there's this language specific challenges. For instance, I teach Mandarin Chinese. Everybody know it's a tongue language. Are you, are you talking about ma or ma? Is it a horse or mom, <laughs> no. right? It's very subtle difference. Yeah, which is even hard hard to pick up when we talk to face to face, right? So so the sound quality is really important, um, and also the written form. You know, we practice handwriting for the characters. Um, so so that's why I if I need to um, give handwriting character writing homework, I would have to ask students to do the handwriting first on the piece of paper, and then either scan it or take a picture or send it to me by email. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the only way. Um, yeah, unless I want to let them to practice typing, because that's one of the important skills too. I really not everybody types in Chinese characters too. So, um, and also when um, uh, th that's how I do when they have like a voc vocabulary quiz or a small test in class, um, they also need to do handwriting, and then either or, or and then they either take a picture or to give to the technician or the test proctors and they scan it later and send it back to me for grading yeah um, and another thing is so that those are the challenging part for the students it's also challenging for the professors too <laughs> so so we have to be really familiar with how to control this monitor how to move the camera around and you know 
be familiar with everything, and also uh, able to improvise quickly and, and adapt uh, teaching styles because lots of things <coughs> can happen, very unexpected. And it can take more time to prepare an effective class. Um, and also it, had, it needs constant coordination among five universities, you know, from the day that you start to look at your enrollment. Because, uh, for example, in my case, if I want to know how many students enroll in my class before a semester starts, on the website from Concordia, I can only see how many students from Concordia enrolled. And I have to, sometimes I have to send out emails to the register to different, of different <coughs> universities to ask, do I get any students from your school? Yeah, so that's a lot of coordinating work. Um, okay, and, oh, I think that's all for my part, and Stephanie, yeah. Mm -hmm. thank you. Take questions now? Yeah, so why yes. Stephanie gets ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stephanie. Were there any particular questions for Ray? Can I use this one? Okay. I a question, although it's engaged. My question was, I noticed that a lot of the challenges that Ray shared have to do with issues with technology, yeah. the quality of technology, um, and how certainly with language learning, I appreciate why that's the fact that it is so important to have the very best possible technology in the classroom available for the students. But other than that, you know, it sounds like it's interesting to me that you know, offering coordinated courses across five institutions, just that aspect, that's no easy feat. And I was just wondering, what is it that you think, that you feel about the faculty relationships or the administrative relationships that's making just that aspect of coordination feasible. Um, I, I, the fact that it's not coming up as a, as a challenge, you know, I, I know it's, it's a great question. It's an absolutely great question. The curriculum and the coordination. I think that and so much of it is, is literally teachers talking to teachers. Yeah, it's like mm -hmm. the, the goodwill and the lack of, um, there's got to be some real trust between the partners and and we'll do more of this. At, we'll do more of this at the question and answer time as well. But one of the things that's amazed me is is how how well the colleagues will jump in and and give them this, these <laughs> these challenges, and they still rise to the occasion. And the students, we still get great evaluations, and the students are learning, and our outcomes. We're hitting our outcomes, oh, yeah. and so it's very very easy for some of us to stand back and go, "This is a complete success." But it all comes down to the fact that these folks are willing to work together, mm -hmm. and we've had good coordinators who actually literally go from campus to campus. They visit each other's okay. campuses. They, mm -hmm. we've had folks. We, we, uh, we host our, we host our yearly. Yes, uh, I gathering. think that two uh, key components that have taken place here is that we have supported the administration, and also that we have very unique students because under these circumstances, you can imagine that a regular student would immediately drop the class. But I can give you the example of two students from TOU that took not just two courses but four. They were so motivated with Chinese. That they say, right. is there any way for us to get a minor in Chinese? And I was like, I don't know. And I said, is there any way to continue? So I need to find, you know, to get the third and then the fourth course. But the students were just very happy. And both of them went to China. So you can see that it's unique, you know, and it's very really unique experience for the students, like especially for the students that are really want to learn the language. And, and one of them said, you know, this is my, this was like my only opportunity to speak Chinese. And her goal, and, and she's very specific, I want to speak five languages. That's a real tribute to Ray. Yeah. I was about to say, we have to say very good teachers. Teacher. Yeah. I have to say, looking at the pictures of what she's controlling, mm -hmm. I'm overawed. <laughs> <laughs> Technology, because what I've done in, in observing her is look at her pedagogic technique. I had no idea she could in you know, the other dimension. Um, I'm Stephanie Ortega, and Ray and I work together. Um, I head our programs and languages. We do not have a department, so I'm coordinating uh, various individual faculty members. And we're in Austin, which is a big pool of people, and there's a lot of turnover. And as you may guess, people who teach in what we call the smaller languages um, circulate among all the uh, universities in Austin. So my job of coordination uh, bridges various universities in the Austin area. Um, how do I make this? Oh, we already got it. Um, I don't teach in the classroom uh, with all this technology. 
I teach German and English, and just in small groups. That's one of the beauties of being at a small private little arts university. I have classes of seven to ten people. Um, so what I'm looking at is uh, the work or the job of the consortium from an administrative perspective, and I'd like to create a ledger and look at it actually from the different dimensions. What is this uh, task for our language teachers? What is this uh, experience for our language learners? And what is it for the administrators who are looking to the learners and to the teachers? And those administrators, because they are administrators, necessarily also are keeping the ledger. They're looking at the bottom line. They're looking at the feasibility um, for the budget. I'd like to start um, with McLuhan. Let's see the hands of those of you who remember old Herbert Marshall McLuhan. Right. <laughs> He's sort of my go-to guru. Um, if you don't know about McLuhan, he was, as a single person, the Center for Technology and Culture at the University of Toronto. And they created that center for him. Um, he gave us such terms as surfing the net. He died, think of this, in 1980 and already could conceptualize the idea of the internet and the, and the ways in which people would learn by moving back and forth among media. Um, here we have him with Ginsburg and his own heaven. <laughs> Uh, Marshall McLuhan also gave us uh, the concept of the global village. Oops. Yeah. And the medium is the message. That's also a term we have from McLuhan. Um, he was a thinker about the ways in which technology and cultural institutions interact. And I sort of juxtaposed his uh, two primary um, buzzwords or buzz terms uh, as complementarity rather than a dichotomy. Because for McLuhan, the global village was not a wonderment. Um, it was a very complex uh, state of almost self-delusion. If technology could augment, augment our connection <coughs> to one another, we had to fill in with our own cognitive process, their presence. And so it was, uh, or the process of creating a global village is like um, a mass suspension of disbelief that we actually are interconnected or know who the other is. And the medium of them is the message is sort of um, imbalance or uh, intention with his notion of the global village. He said that the technology changes our perception, thinking back to Immanuel Kant, it changes our cognitive structures. And his primary or seminal work, the, um, the, um, the Gutenberg Galaxy, looks to the advent of print and says, how reductive. I mean, we're talking about cultural exchange now, which is two-dimensional, a private activity, regarding squiggles on the page. I mean, how abstruse and how disconnected is that project of being connected? And he takes that as his primary model and zooms us into the future. Um, this is, uh, I don't think it, the quality doesn't come out here very well at all, uh, from the work of Arthur Croker, who wrote uh, Digital Humanism. And you can see where I folded the page down the middle. And this is a group of people, mostly younger people, sitting together in the act of storytelling. Croker um, believed that this is what um, uh, McLuhan was getting at with his notion of the global village. Interconnectedness that is somatic, that is kinesthetic, um, that is primary. <coughs> and here we have, from the date of um, McLuhan's uh, Gutenberg Galaxy, a group of students in the library, 1964, all literally plugged in to a uh, language class. So these are people engaged in various uh, varieties of um, language exchange, learning language. 
And I uh, put a little title to this, which of these things is not like the other, which of these things is kind of the same. Did you ever watch with your kids, or on your own, <laughs> for yourself? Uh, that, uh, what is it, Sesame Street? Yeah, Sesame Street program. And I'm getting at something here by talking about children and learning language. Oh, um, <laughs> this is, of course, Mr. Rogers and his inviting landscape. And here we have McLuhan in his own automated hell. <laughs> it's McLuhan looking at McLuhan looking at McLuhan, posturing the devil. And um, both these guys were uh, working with television in the early 60s. Actually, Mr. Rogers hated the television. He thought it was the vehicle of um, interpersonal um, disruption. And so, therefore, he decided he would connect with children. Any of you grow up with Mr. Rogers and feel he was there for you? I've had several autistic students who tell me, he made me feel adorable. He made me feel loved. They felt really connected. So, um, otherness is scary, or it's safe, depending upon how you view the media and what you do with it. Okay, and how does this all relate to language acquisition? And I say language acquisition rather than language learning, because acquisition could be your first language, your home language, or it could be the language that you learn in a structured public environment or some other uh, kind of interpersonal exchange. So we, we keep that term open. Um, most of us in language acquisition have certain assumptions about teaching and acquiring a language as an adult. In a way, we are offering people a, a simulacrum of early experience. Um, we're asking people to accept us, to feel our world is safe and inviting. And um, we also, at this, in this um, way of, of modeling uh, how people learn language, talk about phases in language learning. So a child with his or her first language will first listen, and there'll be a period of latency. And then the child will begin to speak. I have a sound call in here because these are bodily or somatic intermediate kinds of uh, uses of language. And later, when we reach the symbolic uh, stage, we can add reading as a passive activity or receptive activity, and then writing as the uh, correlate to speaking. That's the expressive, but they're again symbolic. Um, in language teaching, we move around. I always have people sit like the little storytelling groups that I had shown in a circle, so all people are looking at all other people. And in a way, we're kind of deconstructing the hierarchy. I'm the teacher, I get the grade, but don't think about that. You're talking to other people. And uh, so it becomes an engagement in the round. Um, uh, we, we engage the whole sensorium. Just like you do with a child, you model things, you touch things, you pass them around, there are colors, there's motion. Um, it's not just uh, language for its symbolic content, rather one-to-one -one communication. And um, how do we learn language? Well, children, even children with, um, with uh, cognitive delays in a bilingual environment become bilingual. So it's not an intellectual task like any other kind of academic learning. Um, children learn language long before they learn to read. So we pause that anyone can learn another language if you make that engagement enticing, if you really look them in the eye and talk to them one to one. And they learn by repetition and by personalizing. In other words, not just saying what you said, but saying what you said that pertains to themselves. So we try to engage the whole subject and we call that immersion. I walk into the class and I don't speak English, and it really works. I promise you it works, just like it works sitting with a child on the, on the floor. You don't have ligatures, 
or ways of relating that to some other language, that language is primary. That language is your vehicle of exchange. And I think that I'm lacking some of the bottom of this. OK, I'm just miming in examples. We use realia. Some of it did get kind of truncated. I talk about uh, using objects as transitional objects in the classroom as well. Okay. So, given this notion of language exchange as primary, as the first kind of communication, something that's not intellectual, how do we use the tools and equipment of the consortium? There's kind of a tension, there's a lack of fit there. Um, I would say that uh, if you're lining up what works and what doesn't, of course we have now the possibility of offering our students a minor, and a minor in German was never possible before. Or even, we're working on this, a major, and that would be an expanded major. So maybe German with music history or something like that. Um, we have a relative guarantee of parity among the language programs, that is, I have a coordinate language can say those students who are working in sign, in American Sign Language, are learning more or less what they would get um, in a sign uh, class at another university in Austin, or more or less what somebody learning French would learn in one semester. And within Indo-European languages, I can kind of say, okay, Dutch and German made their line in this way, but for instance with um, Ray, teaching Mandarin, I just trust her. <laughs> if she teaches at other universities in the area, she knows what the parameters are. And so my job as coordinator of languages is really eased greatly, greatly facilitated by having the consortium. It's like an inbuilt monitor of, of quality of standard. Okay, and we're working on the study abroad. I cannot just take one or two students to Germany <laughs> That's not feasible, and most parents and families wouldn't buy into it either. But with a coordinated program of, of study abroad, uh, it now is possible. The other thing is that we know study abroad, the very existence of study abroad, will bring in minors and majors. Even if students don't want to go themselves, knowing that it's out there somehow, in, is endorsement. It gives us stature. It gives us visibility. And then, of course, um, the longer term uh, aim of the consortium is to um, use the model of languages for other disciplines such as history. But I think there's going to be a real quantum leap there since we do such an entirely different kind of job with language teaching. Um, well, where do we um, <laughs> fall short? Uh, our commitment to faculty living in Austin with the University of Texas, which I think has the biggest enrollment. I think there are 87,000 yeah. students there, a huge lot of faculty. Um, anyone could drop dead tomorrow or say sayonara, and I'm telling you, I could have 12 people at the door ready to teach that class. And so we operate only with adjuncts, only on a semester by semester contract. And that leaves us um, with a kind of cynicism in a way, if you don't mind my saying this, about um, who will constitute our faculty for the consortium. And then there's the issue of salary. If Ray is offering Chinese or Mandarin from our university, are we paying the ticket? Is she part of our faculty and the other universities are reaping or harvesting those tuition dollars? There is a disparity there that is really addressed every semester on an ad hoc, ongoing basis. Okay, you'll throw this much money and you'll throw this much money. And until the last 11th hour and 59th minute, we really never know how we're going to cover people's salaries. And, and that, of course, you know, from an administrative perspective, is big. I mean, that's determinative. It's so big. And then the dissimilarities in institutional structures, as I said, we have no department. We have no forum for getting together as a faculty and discussing where we would like to go with the language programs. And um, other universities have 
language department. So I report directly to the provost, and then that leaves other layers of administration not addressed um, at other institutions. That's really um, for the coordination a barrier. Um, the issue of language requirement. Schreiner did away with language requirement this last semester, right? A year, a year ago, we did a core revision, and some, the majority of the uh, degrees elected not to have a language requirement anymore. Yep. Some held on to it. Yep. And now there's a big pushback from liberal arts. So. I think yeah. from the perspective well, of a language instructor that uh, cultural studies and language are kind of central to a liberal Absolutely. arts institution. I mean, that, that to me is the definitive yeah. character, yeah. characteristic. And yet, um, as the nation goes, so do small liberal arts universities. I was uh, at SUNY Buffalo, one of the big universities, and New York did away with language requirement, and the whole department was, you know, given uh, walking papers. So at small institutions, we're really keen to hang on to a language requirement. And at my university right now, that's up in the air. Will we, in fact, continue? And Ray, you are a stronghold. Fight the power. And the last part, the efficacy. The technology is like massively expensive. We have it as default. Um, actually, the nursing program put in for a quarter of a million dollars and got this phenomenal layout. And um, we are at their behest if they have language, or if they have courses scheduled, we can't schedule languages. Um, so we didn't spend the money, but our institution is in a way putting that. And um, how does that align with what we're spending on faculty and administration to make this whole thing spin? So I conclude with McLuhan that for some place in that interconnectedness, yin yang of things, that's um, in perpetual motion, yeah? What was that? Was that, was that at all related to theological classes and or was that related to medical classes? I know that was have a lot of We have Hebrew. We have Latin and we have Greek, mm -hmm. and those are actually our largest languages. Wow. But that's classical languages, okay. and they're attached to the theological okay. seminary. Yeah. If you get a degree in philosophy, you must that's take classical Greek, mm -hmm. but that's not under my auspices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm pushing for a position that would would uh, pull all those languages together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As part of this lecture of uh, you know, questions of uh, how finance is essentially, um, how are you handling the challenges around small course sizes, even in the hybrid learning world? So when you have a class with three students, one student each of three institutions, you know, that still isn't necessarily down the line. I mean, that, that, even that may not be happening that student. So what are you thinking? That's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. I go forward to my dean who goes forward to my provost saying, couldn't we show some good faith here in getting consortium up and running? And so they suspend. Um, We've done that for a while now. That's yeah, right. I think we're we're reaching sort of the end of that good faith part. <laughs> yeah, they don't want to spend money for two students at another university. Yeah, I guess I have questions that seem to be at odds with one another. One is about the fact of hybrid versus online and hybrid being better. But it isn't either or. So the question is, given the high overhead involved with the technological investment and the multiple screens of the noisy students in other places, the question, I guess, is to think about what balance between something more online and then something strategically interpersonal. Uh, what are the different ways of thinking of that? And then the other thing you mentioned about the affective, as opposed to the, or how you engage students right away. Uh, as someone who got into French by singing along with the Yacht Records. <laughs> um, in other words, as you're drawing students in, and then when you talk about it, isn't just the symbolic, as you said, or referential. Um, parts of language. This is getting a little stream of consciousness, I realize. 
But there are so many interesting things going on now sociolinguistically with code switching and this and that. Mm -hmm. To what extent does one get into engaging students in thinking about that kind of stuff, particularly in terms of bilingualism with Spanish in a place like Texas? Mm, a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Feel free to. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I can answer it more as a person who also teaches in English, and that is a department. Mm -hmm. um, I think students really enjoy that a lot, affectively. Uh, there is that connection. And I'm learning from them because I really was one of. Makula's primitive people that sat alone in the library with the book, you know. Um, I don't know how that applies to languages so much because I teach 10 people sitting on chairs looking at each other. How would you answer that? Well, I can, I guess I started teaching like an entirely online Chinese course this summer. I guess I can kind of compare these two a little bit. Uh, for the, um, the entirely online course, I just upload some video lecture. Um, and some um, hopefully helpful exercise online as students supposed to study by themselves. But I know that's more, far less than enough for language teaching. So I try to set up a live classroom every week with them. But some of the students there are like uh, full-time working professionals. So it's very hard to find a time that everybody can join. But again, Moodle can do the recording thing for the, for the live session so they can view the live session later. Um, so, but from the interaction with the students that I can see on the live uh, classroom so far, they they are also think this is a very challenging way to do language entirely online, even with the live session. Um, but um, I think um, so. So the, the 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 consortium class, I think, actually uh, provides much more, much better opportunity for the students to have the real time interaction at least four hours a week, three or four hours a week. And, and they, they already made the commitment, they have the time available, you know, they can come to the classroom and they do the real person interaction. So I'll tell mom how she, she travels around and meets them and she coordinates yeah. things so they cook and do things together. So there is extracurricular engagement that I think allows people to imagine that two-dimensional screen as a, as a human being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the CIC consortium runs for the Big Ten colleges. They do a lot of language sharing. And what they have found is that the, the, the dollar information, what they have found is that it's a wash. They do about 150 students a semester. They said. So the lecture really does. Yeah, even yeah. out. I mean, they, they, they tried at first to do charge it out. And, and, and what they were spending in that was more than really anything they might be losing. And there's always the huge upfront investment. If you don't have the technology, your institution is putting out large chunks of cash to make that happen. And then you have to uh, distribute that over time. But if you contact them, I mean, if you're trying to talk to other administrators, they, they have to do cool stuff to you. Do we need the name of the consortium? The CIC, there's two CICs. One is Council of Independent Colleges, which is not what for. The other is yeah, the CIC is ready for it. It's a consortium of uh, large state universities plus the University of Chicago. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Yeah, so what did you follow up on, uh, Judith, uh, point of the online, uh, completely online course versus this experiment? Because I think it's really worth uh, um, exploring. I love my. Um, Experience. I'm a Wellesley College of Teaching Area, and I have developed a, a fully online course with other Wellesley College now. So we have used it two different ways. One in the summer, because that's another issue. What do we do with our summer campuses? And uh, one of the problems of the college is that well, we're always looking to, for revenue, uh, but the, the buildings are underused on campus. And inviting students to take a classical, you know, typical summer course, residential, four or six weeks, it's no longer viable. Students don't have the resources, don't have the time. So we have decided to offer Italian entirely online in the summer, um, inviting just the Wesley students and the Wesley community, meaning uh, alumni, administrators, 
We had the first summer an enrollment of 560. Uh, but we use it not to give credits, just to attract students to our program. And then uh, they will try to place out of the first or second semester and go directly into the intermediate mm -hmm. because that's, we're trying to address precisely the problem that uh, you, I don't see your name, William, William, yes, William, yes uh, uh, mentioned at the beginning, uh, which is larger enrollment in beginning classes in languages and the pyramid goes up really quickly and we cannot populate uh, you know in the intermediate or advanced languages I mean level courses so this way hopefully and we did get some initial very good results so by offering an online class in the summer for free we attract the large number of students even if we had uh, an attrition rate that was high because it always happens online but the course is, is open we still have students coming in into our uh, maybe second semester and some placing at the intermediate level so we were repeating the experiment this summer and that could be a different model on how to achieve higher enrollment yes. For the upper level. Yes, in the upper level. So I think that there are many ways of mm -hmm. doing this. And are those regular faculty members who are also available for the summer? Pardon? Are those regular faculty members? That's me, yes. <laughs> so she's <laughs> so during the academic year and over the summer. And the summer, but the um, being available is really very relative because the course is online. So you're available to answer questions, discussion board, that to engage with students on, online, not to be trained. And you, will the person who asked you also have for, her, uh, for her, uh, do, you, do you have her email address? Should we put oh. that on the board so that you can get all the materials? Yeah, sure. I really want to thank uh, our panelists for a beautiful time. <laughs>